Greetings, everyone. And welcome to the Disparity to Parity Project's webinar on environmental resilience through agricultural policy. Um, unfortunately, our expected host, Nian Story, was not able to join us today. She sends her apologies and regrets and, and also gratitude for all of you who are participating and all of you who are joining us to learn today from each other. Just a little bit of background. Um, my name is Lisa Griffith. I'm with the National Family Farm Coalition as the Communications and Outreach Coordinator. And NFFC uh, was a founding co-founding organization of the Parity Project, um, which has since um, evolved into this beautiful collection of essays and webinars and conversations about what parity means, what it has meant historically, and what it means for the future. And today we are very fortunate to hear from leaders from the farm worker community, advocate community, um, also indigenous leaders and organic farmers who are going to give us their insights and perspectives and experience. One of the, um, one of the early essayists um, in environmental resilience category at the website is Amanda Starbuck. And she joins us um, as a research director uh, from Food and Water Watch, and she will moderate the program for us. We are very grateful to Amanda and all at Food and Water Watch who have been so supportive of NFFC and the works on parity. So thank you, Amanda. Great, thank you so much, Lisa. Um, really honored to be moderating today. So my name is Amanda Starbeck, and as mentioned, I am the research director at Food and Water Watch. Food and Water Watch is a national nonprofit organization with offices across the country, working to mobilize everyday people to address the fundamental crises facing our food, water, and climate. So first, just a couple of housekeeping items. So this webinar is being recorded today and will be made available afterwards. And we welcome your questions at any point throughout the presentation. You can use the Q&A box to submit your questions, direct them to a specific speaker or to the group as a whole. And panelists can respond in the chat box and we'll also leave some room at the end for a questions and answers, answers portion. So as I was preparing for today, I kept thinking about my grandmother whose family had lived through the Dust Bowl on their farm south of Minot, North Dakota. And she always called her childhood the dirty 30s, a term that really had dual meaning for her. It was not only a time of extreme financial hardship, but for her and the many other farming families in the Great Plains, it was physically dirty. Dust storms were literally blowing the topsoil off of their fields. As a child, I always imagined the dust bowl as just some kind of unfortunate natural disaster, but I know now that this is largely a human-made one. The US government had encouraged farmers to increase their grain production during the Great War to help defeat Europe. But as Europe recovered, the demand for U.S. grain plummeted, and with it went crop prices. Farmers were left with fuel tools in their toolbox to try to recuperate from these losses. Aside from just trying to get as much yield as they could out of their existing fields, either by intensive practices or even encroaching onto erodible land. There wasn't room in the, for resiliency in the system, and it took an ecological toll. And this is when the U.S. government stepped in and implemented supply management programs that benefited some farmers, and included things like payments for soil building practices or even letting vulnerable land lie fallow. But fast forward almost 100 years and we seem to be repeating ourselves. The US continues to overproduce grain crops, including for the export market, but this time they're largely not feeding people, but instead livestock on factory farms, ethanol, and various food like additives. And once again, without supply management, farmers are left with little opportunity or incentive to practice resilience. But this time, we're also dealing with a climate crisis, the Western mega drought, winter wildfires, and deadly heat events that are threatening our nation's farm workers. National attention is increasingly being turned towards agriculture's role in the climate crisis. But unfortunately, farmers and rural communities are often either left out of conversation entirely or even villainized, such as in a recent New York Times video series that mocked the idea of a family farm. Meanwhile, the very corporations who are capturing the majority of profits in the system are offering their own market-based solutions, things like carbon credits and factory farm gas, that will only serve to further entrench their power. We need robust policy solutions to address the most critical threats facing our environment and food systems, and this must include supply management. But this time, it needs to be farmer and farm worker-led, including farmers who have been historically left out of USDA programs. 
A solution to agricultural ecological crisis will not come from a big seed company or a tech startup. It will come from the wisdom of organic regenerative practices and by listening to farmers from traditions that have always placed resiliency at the core. And that is why I'm truly honored to welcome our guest today. Um, our first speaker was supposed to be Brenda Jo McManama, who is the Save Our Roots campaign coordinator with the Indigenous Environmental Network. Unfortunately, Brenda is experiencing some connectivity issues, um, really highlighting the importance of rural broadband and really keeping us all connected. So she sends her regrets. Um, but we're going to hear first from Jeannie Economist, who is the Pesticide Safety and Environmental Health Program Coordinator of the Farm Worker Association of Florida. And her work includes training farm workers in Florida of their rights and how to protect their families from pesticide exposure. Then we'll hear from Michael Sly, who comes from a long line of West Texas family farmers and has helped found numerous organizations, including the Agricultural Justice Project. Then we'll hear from Kevin Engelbert, who founded the first certified organic dairy farm and has also served on the National Organic Standards Board. And he will share his experience and wisdom for being at the forefront of this movement. And finally, we'll have Marcus Briggs Clouds, who's the founder of Muskogee Eco Village, Exxon Yesovic, and he is going to give us some closing remarks. So with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Jeannie. Thank you very much. Um, oh, well, that's very cute. I like that. <laughs> um, my name is Jeannie Economist, as um, Amanda said. Um, I um, have been working with the Farm Worker Association of Florida for over, um, 25 years. Um, but first, I want to say, who are farm workers? The co founder of the Farm Worker Association of Florida was a farm worker himself. He used to be an orange harvester in Central Florida. And Tirso Moreno used to say, farm workers are just landless farmers. I think that's really key and really critical because farm workers are the invisible people that most of us don't see and don't even think about, but they are the ones that are harvesting our food every day and with whose work without, we would not be able to have any food to eat. So every single day of our lives, whether we're aware of it or not, we are dependent on the work of farm workers. And farm workers are the ones that don't have access to land, don't have access to capital, and many of them are escaping conditions in their home countries uh, and come here as undocumented immigrants to do the hard work in the agricultural fields that the rest of us depend on. We're showing these slides here because I think it's really important to see the farm workers themselves in the fields and to bring their reality into this discussion. So farm workers have been invisible for 400 years. Um, until recently under the pandemic, they finally became the essential workers um, that, um, you know, that, that we've been talking about in the news. Essential, but expendable. So I say 400 years, it's really important to understand the legacy of farm workers in the United States today. In the Southeastern US, farm workers it, uh, um, historically were enslaved peoples from Africa that worked on the plantations in, um, in the Southeast that produced the food and the cotton that uh, supplied the clothes and, um, and food for the rest of the country that helped to build this nation. And you often don't hear about them. Um, and the uh, African-Americans um, after slavery ended, they became indentured servants or sharecroppers um, until today we have uh, an exploitable labor force of mostly Hispanic and in Florida and the Southeast Haitian farm workers. So our system of agriculture has always been looking for a cheap, exploitable labor force. And it's important to understand inherently in our system of agriculture, the way it's been established, it's been based in a sense of racism and a sense of exploiting the environment and exploiting people. And it's really and, and, and people's labor. And it's really important to understand that deep underpinning of our system of agriculture because we need to understand that history if we're going to transform the way we do agriculture. So again, um, ag farm workers are just landless farmers. Who are they? They are the people who make minimum wages for some of the hardest work in our country that we all depend on. They have some of the least rights 
Farm workers were excluded from the National Labor Relations Act and the Fair Labor Standards that um, covered almost all other workers in the United States. They don't have the right to organize. Um, they just recently in the last few years were able to get the minimum wage. And again, these people are the invisible people, but they are essential every day to all of us. The Farm Worker Association is working to have better living and working conditions for farm workers. Farm workers are also exposed to some of the worst agrochemicals in the fields and in their workplaces. Um, the Farm Worker Association does health and safety trainings for farm workers to help them learn how to protect themselves from pesticide exposure and more recently also from heat stress related to climate change and um, environmental conditions um, because of the climate. So um, again, this has been historic that farm workers have been faced with these kinds of living and working conditions. And it's important to understand also that farm workers have been called unskilled labor and they've been denigrated for being um, low income and low literacy and low education. But farm work is critically skilled work. Uh, try it sometime. It takes a lot of skill to do farm work and farm workers' knowledge and experience has not been acknowledged. A lot of farm workers come from Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, Mexico, Haiti, and other Central American countries. And they bring indigenous knowledge to this country, including ancestral seeds, ethnic folkways, and ethnic ways of, um, of growing and harvesting food. And there's a large uh, African-American population in this country who are descended from sharecroppers and indentured servants who also have a long history and legacy of working on the farms and who have knowledge and, um, and experience in farming. What's important is to recognize these skills, recognize this knowledge, and recognize the inherent dignity and worth and give respect to the people who are, are harvesting our food every single day. That's one of the roles of the Farm Worker Association of Florida. And, you know, the farm worker movement's been fighting for farm worker justice for 50, 60, 70, and you can even say hundreds of years trying to get justice for the people that harvest our food. And the reality is that without significant systemic and institutional change in our entire system of agriculture, we're not gonna make progress. So in the last 10 years, the Farm Worker Association of Florida has embraced food sovereignty and agroecology as core principles that not only lift up, center and build leadership among farm workers and give them some control in their own communities, but also use practices that help address the root causes of climate change in agriculture and help to heal the environment. So let me just say quickly, uh, food sovereignty is giving local control back to communities over their food system because our corporate industrial agricultural system um, dominates our choices of food and how our food is produced. Food sovereignty, means giving people back control of their own food system in local sustainable communities. Agroecology is using principles that enhance the environment by doing agriculture, that it, it's beyond sustainable, it's beyond organic, and you can see the pesticides there. We don't need these chemicals on our food and we don't need these chemicals on our environment, and we certainly don't need them poisoning farm workers and their families. So we, we use agroecology in a deep practice where we lift up and share um, indigenous knowledge from people's home countries. And we use agroecology in our community gardens programs to not only grow food, but build community and build collaboration um, in our local communities. And it's part of a larger nationwide movement for agroecology and food sovereignty. We're also members of La Via Campesina, which is an international movement of people looking to take back our food system. I could talk for a lot longer, but I'll stop there. And I welcome any questions. Um, and I want you to see these pictures because my face should not be here. These are the people, the faces that you're seeing right now, 
These are the people that are the backbone of our agricultural industry. I will say one last thing. If there were no farm workers, there would be no food. Thank you. Great, right. thank you so much, Jeannie. Um, now we're gonna hear from Michael Sly. I'm having a bit of a senior moment. I think I'll get there though. Many thanks to the organizers for this opportunity to share. I'm honored to be a part of this. I want to focus my time on the urgent needs to reinvigorate public cultivar development to respond to climate change by rediversifying our agricultural landscapes. There are five major counter prevailing trends that must be rectified if we are to succeed in time. But first, briefly, I want to mention how I kind of got into this. I was farming the decade of the, of the 70s. If I can get it to move forward. Yes, and I received this report in the mail in 1979 from some small scrappy group in North Carolina. And they said something dangerous was happening with our seed supply. Why was companies like Monsanto buying up mom and pop seed companies? Where would they be going with this? What would, where would this end if we did not fight back? I can't seem to, I'm sorry, but I can't seem to move it forward. Yeah, thank you. So this is just an example in 1979 of agrochemical companies beginning to buy mom and pop seed companies. We all know that whoever controls the seed can control agriculture. This was the beginning of what has become one of the most highly concentrated power grabs by the few, which I will say more about shortly. But these five global trends must be mitigated, reversed, and held responsible for their consequences. Solutions to these challenges must be embedded in any progressive reform agenda from the local to the global. This is a perfect storm, no pun intended. However, the solutions are also at hand. Raffi started tracking who owned seeds back in the 1970s. And we're grateful that Phil Howard at Michigan State University has picked up this task. If we look today from 1979, we now see that four gene giants control 60% of the commercial seeds worldwide. This equals a loss of seed choices to farmers, higher seed prices, and more patents with greater control. This is uh, Phil's slide that shows you as a visual, these four red bubbles equaling 60% of control of commercial seed varieties. I think it's important that we be clear that we are witnessing one of the greatest shifts in, in the history of agriculture. This is a shift from farmers as autonomous producers and plant breeders and seed savers to farmers as renters of patented germplasm. Every effort to restore farmers' rights to save seeds and breeders' rights to share germplasm is essential to re-diversifying our landscapes and our diets. We must also couple this, stuck again, with a concurrent loss of public plant breeders. Classical plant breeding is this combination of science and art. It must be learned and taught in the field. Fewer and fewer universities are keeping and training public plant breeders. Our Seeds and Breeds Coalition a number of years back looked at 20 years from 2014 back to 1994 and found a 33% decline in public plant breeding programs across America. This is a very 
dangerous trend at a moment when public plant breeding at the regional level is so urgently needed to combat climate change. Loss of agricultural biodiversity. UNFAO now says we've lost half of our agricultural biodiversity in the last 50 years, mostly due to the so-called green revolution and displacement and loss of farming communities. Now GMO and climate change are even accelerating this. I put this slide in just to give an example of, of looking at 10 vegetable varieties and how many varieties were available in 1903 and then comparing it to what was available in 1983 you can see the width of these of these bars is the number of varieties and the bottom you can see that it's just trailing off into very few choices so it's very important to understand this But at the same time, I think we, it's, it's, as has been mentioned, this vast variety of crops that we enjoy today would not be here if it was not for the innovation, dedication, and skills of indigenous farming communities for millennia. Most of these varieties and crops we know today have been nurtured in the centers of biodiversity where farmers selected, saved, shared, and passed on these seeds. So any progressive reform agenda must include this leadership and their rights and needs. Organic agriculture also own, owes much of its techniques and skills to the perseverance of these farmers as well. Climate change. We're entering a new era, of the Anthropocene, where human activity is changing the future climate of our planet. We've witnessed globally over 3,500 year weather events in the last 12 years alone. So many farmers are now saying it's too wet, it's too cold, it's too dry, it's too hot, sometimes all in the same season. The Treaty on Biodiversity and Genetic Resources was developed to create fair terms of global sharing of our common heritage of seeds and breeds to prevent biopiracy to restore farmers' rights to seeds and the sharing of benefits. This treaty has a long way to go to meet these lofty goals, but it is yet another important tool that must be pursued. It's important to realize that of the several hundred thousand known plant species, about 120 are commercially cultivated for food production, with about nine supplying about 75% of the global plant derived energy intake, and only three, wheat, rice, and corn, accounting for nearly 50%. While at the same time, there are over 6 million seed accessions stored worldwide in over a 1,000 gene banks. 80 to 95% of this plant material in gene banks worldwide is still uncharacterized, which means we don't know its major contribution to biodiversity. So there are some important positive trends at the same time. In the last decade, we have managed to increase funding for organic and non-GMO seed development. There is a beginning of clusters of seeds and breed adaptation at the regional level. There is a reemergence of small seed companies. We're beginning to see a new generation of public plant breeders. There is a rapid demand for organic and non-GMO seeds and there is growing public awareness of this seed crisis. I think I would end with just a few recommendations. I don't know if time allows me to read all of these, but I certainly will uh, forward this for further discussion. Needless to say, we need a comprehensive national plan for the next farm bill to increase funding and regional capacity for public cultivar development. We need to build greater rewards for real crop rotations, carbon sequestration, increased on-farm biodiversity, and polluter pay for GMO contamination. You can see there is a long list of here, and I'm sure all of those participating today will have other good suggestions as well. I just stress that we must have a plan 
And I would conclude by saying that equity, diversity, and inclusion are not merely politically correct terms. They are essential to us finding the right solutions. History will not only judge us by what we do, but what we have failed to protect. We will not get to the shores of sustainability with environmental stewardship alone. We must demand justice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. That was wonderful. Um, and now we're going to hear from Kevin Engelbert. Okay, am I am I on? You're on. Okay. Well, my my perspective obviously is is from that of a lifetime organic dairy farmer, um, and to see where we're at right now, you've got to look at where we've been and why we're why we're there. There's always been, in my lifetime, a history of cheap food. The government demands cheap food. People have come to expect cheap food, and in a large part, that's why our agricultural system is where it's at today. Um, my father was a Cornell alum, and in the 40s and 50s, he began to intent, farm intensively using every available tool that was coming along, the next, the next latest, greatest, from herbicides and pesticides to um, giving cows hormone shots to, to you name it. And we had reached a point by the 70s that we couldn't keep our cows healthy and we couldn't, couldn't grow crops. And you didn't have to be a genius to realize that there was a connection between the, the $25,000 a year that we were spending on um, chemical inputs at that time was directly related to the $1,000 a month that we were spending on vet bills trying to keep, trying to keep our animals alive. So we started farming organically in 1980, 1980 with a few fields just to see what would happen because you know, nobody believed that you could farm on a commercial scale without the use of chemicals and, and all the other inputs that uh, were necessary to produce large yields with, with uh, very little labor. But we were successful and by 1984, we were fully or certified or fully organic, all of our fields had transitioned and we got certified and hoped to market our milk as certified organic with a small plant. But back then everybody thought it was just a fad and, and um, you know, nothing was gonna come of it. So we, we couldn't get financing and basically transitioned for 20 years until we finally got a solid organic milk market in the meantime with Organic Valley. And then about 12 years ago, we started to diversify our operation because I had two of my three sons decided they wanted to take over the family farm. They're the sixth generation um, to do so. So we started finding more land and transitioning it to organic and started an organic grain business. And my wife started uh, selling our meat. We started a beef business and started selling um, organic beef and pork. And we found a local um, small milk processor that would come and pick up milk and Organic Valley allowed us to divert some of our milk into cheese under our own label. And a small distribution business where we could take food and or take meat and cheese to different restaurants and stores in our area and it's you know we're, we're slowly evolving in that direction and the biggest thing is continue this change kevin we are having a hard time hearing you sorry i don't i don't know why that's better okay um and i and we have we, we've worked hard towards diversifying our operation and educating the public that that organic does make a difference um, there's no hidden cost with our organic food. There's no subsidies required for us to continue. We just need to be paid a fair price for, for our labors. Now, a lot of the times, I'm sure you've all read 
about what's happening in the organic deer industry, especially here in the Northeast, where there have been 135 dairies that have lost their market. Um, a lot of what's needed to change the direction and increase the sales of organic is honesty in the organic business and integrity. And we lack that to a large degree. The, the get big or get out mantra, which was supposed to lead to cheap food, has infiltrated the organic dairy industry. And you now have operations that the last probably 10 years ago, they, it started with the expansion of CAFOs, confined animal feeding operations, not only in numbers, but their size. And that's also when we started having hydroponics get certified organic. And that's when um, illegal grain started being brought into the country. So it's very difficult to move the movement in the right direction without the lack of morality. And that's almost impossible to legislate. So, you know, I don't, I don't have any answers there. You've got people, and it's, it's not simply the, at the fault of the National Organic Program that these operations are being allowed. It's the owners themselves, the people that work there, the certifiers that allow it, the people that sell the illegal grain that's not really um, organic, the people that start up hydroponic operations and get them certified as organic, and all of it. It's an entire swath of people that don't have, I'm not sure how else to say it, they don't have the moral standard to do what's right. They only worship money. They their only objective is to accumulate wealth and to solve problems with, as one of the early speakers said, paying these farm workers the right amount or a fair amount, you have to pay the people that own the operation a fair amount first. They can't, they can't pay people um, what they should unless they're getting paid properly themselves. So, in a nutshell, that's that's where we're at. We're at we're at this look, position of trying to figure out what to do about paying people properly, about saving the environment, um, because of the policies that have been handed down from federal government, the cheap food policy, um, for for generations. And it's going to take education to make people realize that they the only way it's going to change is for them to realize that that we'll all be better off in the long run if, uh, if those changes are made and true organic agriculture is supported. And, and I, I think I'll close right there. I know that was short, but I'd be more than happy to, to answer any questions about my operation, our farm, my family, or, or my thoughts on anything else that we can, that can be done differently. Wonderful, thank you so much, Kevin. And last, we're going to get some closing statements from Marcus Briggs Cloud. So, if you could converse with your holder, and I'm a legal woods, I wouldn't do as and would all get it, would you do as more and Connibal games go walk you to a same? Yeah, we dag you whole and my name's Marcus Briggs Cloud. I'm a Muscogee person and a son of the Wing Clan and an in law to the Skunk Clan. Uh, we're here in our traditional Muscogee homelands, uh, what's commonly colonially known as Alabama and Georgia. Uh, we were forcibly removed from here in, in uh, the 1830s. 1836 um, was mandated uh, that uh, we be removed, and um, nearly 40% of our people uh, were murdered in a mass genocide over a 20 year period then. And uh, we're the descendants of those survivors. Um, and uh, about four years ago in January, um, a group of like minded uh, Muscogee persons uh, came back here to our homelands. And um, the impetus for our work is really a language revitalization and recognizing that 
that. Um, uh, we, uh, the, the biggest threat to the survival of our language is obsolescence uh, because we interface with settler colonial societies that have an abundance of vocabulary that our own languages don't have. And uh, so instead of um, just uh, importing tons of terms into our lexicon that are inherently premised on post-industrialization capitalist ideology, um, the theory of our community, of our eco-village community here is uh, to recreate the society in which our language once functioned best. And that's a society that's inherently premised on intimate relations with the natural world. And so um, our, our belief, though, is that uh, for traditionally agrarian Indigenous societies, that uh, if our contemporary life ways are not fixated on regenerative agricultural practices, uh, that there's no possibility that our uh, languages are going to be able uh, to thrive. We have only 22 speakers of our language left east of the Mississippi um, and uh, west of the Mississippi, uh, about uh, fewer than 200, and most of them are over the age of 65 and for health. Uh, so uh, we come, came back here to our homelands. Uh, we live on uh, 1,240 acres here. Uh, and we, we operate a language immersion program where we speak exclusively in our language. And as I mentioned, um, you know, we, we, um, we, we raise animals here and crops, and um, this is all part of our spiritual life ways. Uh, and it's what consumes the majority of our conversation throughout the day. So we have created the container um, because of agriculture, uh, because the agricultural cycle is tied to um, our spiritual lives, our ceremonial cycle, it's what dictates it, in fact, that um, we are able to host, um, uh, live in, a, in an environment where our language can be uh, spoken throughout the entire day, anywhere from the behaviors of animals um, to our responsibilities to the animals, to the plants um, that we're in relationship with and renew our relationship with through our annual renewal ceremonies that we have. Um, and so uh, we, we live off grid here. We're uh, building um, uh, an off grid community through natural building. Um, and and uh, we, we uh, do timber framing here, um, which we, we go into the forest and select trees based on species population densities in a basal area for sustainable harvest. And uh, we have a ceremony with every tree before we fell it. And um, that sometimes the trees, they don't want to be cut and you have to communicate with them and, and you have to, um, you don't want to cut a tree that doesn't want to be felled uh, because they'll, it'll lodge negativity into your building. And so uh, we go on to the next one and we fell them and we harvest that, uh, we um, uh, skid them to, and put them on the sawmill here to avoid the embodied energy and carbon emissions and fossil fuel consumption that would have been required to import from offsite. Um, and, and we do straw bale, wall insulation, and earth and plaster made from clay and sand and wheat straw and buffalo poop. Um, and then uh, we, many, many uh, natural building pieces, but that's one of the, the pieces of living in right relationship with the natural world that has to, we have to have this kind of holistic paradigmatic shift that's rooted in a, a decolonization framework uh, here. And so um, all the animals that we work with here, we, we um, have intimate relationship with them and honor them in our ceremonies um, so that uh, we can harvest them in a good way. Um, we, we raise a uh, sturgeon, we have a fish farm here, which is a culturally significant species to our people. It's 136 million year old species. And because of that ancient knowledge they carry, our ancestors have always uh, revered them. And um, uh, so uh, we are, we, we hatch them, we, we spawn them and hatch them out and, and grow them out and put them back into the river from which they were extirpated in the 1950s because of the hydroelectric dams that were erected in the, in the stream. So they couldn't return to their natal spawning areas. And um, we, we raise um, a buffalo, which are also culturally iconic. And um, we work with endangered livestock breeds, such as uh, the guinea hogs and San Clemente Island goats and um, a number of uh, in, uh, endangered um, chicken, uh, uh, endangered uh, chicken breeds. And um, this is uh, 
part also of uh, our food sovereignty work here because our elders are dying prematurely that are language bearers in, in their 60s, in fact, of chronic illnesses that are preventable by better dietary management. And so they take the language with them. And so what we've done to decolonize our diet here is um, uh, to, to eat the food that is grown here and see major transformation in our elders that are coming off of insulin and no longer taking high blood pressure medicines, et cetera, um, and have more energy to work with our children to whom we've never spoken English uh, since they were born. Um, and, and this is how we're keeping our language alive here in our community. Um, and so agriculture, natural building, language and cultural revitalization, um, ecological restoration work. We live here in a, in a uh, uh, critically endangered montane longleaf pine ecosystem that is fire adapted. So we're restoring uh, uh, this ecosystem here through fire and through ceremony. Um, all these things work together. Um, so I, I, I want to just, um, you know, make some comments about um, uh, some of the, the things that have been mentioned here before, um, but, well, uh, Michael and, and Kevin and Jeannie, they all mention uh, uh, the Indigenous peoples and the origins of seeds. Um, you know, there's this great irony that uh, corn, for instance, major commodity, but uh, the corn is something that our ancestors domesticated, and it's not just saving seed um, and, and, and the work uh, that, that uh, physical work that has been done over uh, across generations um, to bring the corn into this uh, uh, era that we live in today, but it's the spiritual investment that people made through ceremonies. Um, you don't just plant corn and harvest corn and save seed and, uh, and select for traits. You, you uh, have to uh, put in uh, the work uh, with the spiritual work uh, to fast and give thanks. You have to offer gratitude. These are things that are missing from uh, industrial ag will never have it. Um, and, and we want to see uh, people come to this way of life. Uh, part of the, the issue is um, not being rooted in place. And then as indigenous peoples, uh, having connection to place since time and memorial is really uh, key in what our, uh, the, the fact that our rituals renew our, our uh, commitment, they reinscribe a commitment to be a good steward of the natural world, to be in right relationship with Mother Earth. And if you don't have this kind of intergenerational connection to the land, uh, it makes the, the kind of industrial, agricultural, multinational, corporate, uh, corporate um, seed theft uh, uh, permissible. And so we have to have people invested in place uh, to cease the environmental destruction um, that, that, uh, that is so ubiquitous. Um, I think also that um, when we think about, um, when we think about ways uh, to sort of decolonize the agricultural system, it's really tied to how we can make this just transition to um, more equitable life ways uh, and uh, adopt more simplistic life ways uh, to abandon this kind of extractive economic model that people have become so accustomed to. Um, and so People living in community is so important uh, when, when people are operating on this kind of, you know, free enterprise, individualistic American dream model. Uh, it, it puts the bottom line profit over uh, what is best for Mother Earth. And so um, when people live in community with one another, um, it takes the burden off of um, off of the individual, um, just as Kevin mentioned, you know, you have to be able to, to pay the, the people that are running the farm. And of course you have to be able to uh, pay a living wage to the farm workers. Uh, we know this now, but um, well, uh, maybe the people living it know it, other people don't know it, but um, when, when folks are not trying to keep up with um, American a standard wage, uh, it, changes, uh, it changes the ability to be in right relationship with Mother Earth. Here in our 
community, we uh, all everybody uh, performs labor seven days a week, sometimes 12 hour days, except when we have our ceremonies. Um, but we do that in exchange for food and labor and a $400 monthly stipend. We all live, um, everybody receives the same amount of money, regardless of your education status or your skill set. And we do this to be um, in, in uh, right relationship with Mother Earth through not uh, accumulating capital and accumulating material possessions, the capitalist consumerist model that only exacerbates extraction of the, from the natural world, it harms Mother Earth, it rapes Mother Earth. Uh, these are act actions that have to cease. And, um, but when you th start thinking about debt and, and, and the way that agricultural practitioners are swimming in debt, it's a major injustice. And so uh, we believe that it's imperative that people have access to land without debt. Um, this is, uh, the, we feel the role of philanthropy to, um, to start circulating, unlocking the capital, letting it flow and allow people to um, have agency in living simply. And I, what I mean is by not accumulating wealth and, and it's, we are not impoverished here. We choose to live this way because we know it's the right thing to do. And, and so um, there's much more to be said about this, um, but I just um, want to say that living in community is just essential um, as opposed to the individualist kind of nuclear family model that um, American capitalism or the industrial world in general has uh, permitted and, and encouraged and bred. And uh, it's a sick system that we have to, to abandon if we're going to get right on the right track. And it's one that our ancestors um, subscribed to embodied since time immemorial. And it's, it's part of our decolonial journey to get back to that because um, it was part of American uh, plan to turn us into that nuclear family individualist model because it would break up our communal wealth system and strip us of our identity and further uh, promote the assimilation to a more Eurocentric life way um, and, and uh, it would get rid of the Indian problem in, in the American context. Um, and so I, I feel in solidarity here today with all the speakers that um, have spoken thus far and and um, I'm also uh, open to, to questions um, if, if they come and uh, appreciate the invitation to be with you all here. Thank you so much, Marcus. Thank you so much, Marcus. Thank you so much, Marcus. Wonderful. So we have quite a bit of time for questions and wonderful questions that I've been rolling through. So um, let's dig right into it. Um, we had a question from one of the um, people who are watching asking about dairy farmers in Canada um, and if there's a difference between how dairy farmers in Canada are faring versus in the US. Um, would anybody like to address that question? I don't think we have any takers on that one. Um, I know that, you know- I, I can- Oh, please do, yes, please. <laughs> I can give you a little bit I know about dairy farming in Canada. They, uh, they have a system where they pay their farmers. I don't think they determine or base it on parity, but they pay their farmers very well. And they, they're actually very few organic dairy farmers in Canada. Organic Valley sends a lot of organic milk up there to meet demand because their conventional farmers are paid so well that it's not worth worth it for most of them to to farm organically. Thank you. I'll give others a second in case they wanted to jump in. Okay, we got a question early on um, for Jeannie when she was giving her a talk, um, asking about the prospects of getting the NL NLRA, which I believe is the National Labor um, Relations Act, and the FLSA, the Federal Labor Standards Act, amended to include egg workers. Um, and if there's any kind of organizations working on these campaigns already. And Jeannie, you've definitely answered that 
very fully in the text, but it might be kind of good to talk about it live as well, so we can all hear. Sure. Um, so uh, for folks that don't know, the, uh, one, the National Labor Relations Act and the um, uh, um, National Labor and the Farm Labor um, Standards Act um, both excluded farm workers. And, um, and that was also the legacy of slavery um, because the two classes of workers um, that were excluded from the Fair Labor Standards of the National Labor Relations Act were farm workers and domestic workers. And this was the work that slaves did on the plantations in the plantations owners homes. They worked in the fields and they worked in the plant as domestic workers in the homes of the plantation owners. So the, there's historic um, legacy behind those two laws. And it was at the pressure and the power of the agricultural industry that both of those laws excluded farm workers. Um, there are some efforts to amend both of those laws. There has been a little bit of progress um, because the Fair Labor Standards did exclude farm workers from minimum wage. Um, there has been, um, a, 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 most states do uh, have minimum wage for farm workers now. Um, some states have approved the right for farm workers to organize and so and have approved the right for farm workers to um, get overtime. Um, it's not national, but a few states have made some laws. So there is some pressure in that direction. Farm Worker Justice is a national organization and United Farm Workers are both working on those um, to try and get the national laws amended. But they, it is a very heavy lift for both of those. And, um, and so a lot of work is being done at the state level. Um, I, I am in Florida and it's not a very good um, uh, uh, conditions here in our state legislature to try and get um, those kinds of uh, changes here. But some of the more progressive states um, have been working on trying to get statewide changes. Um, like I said in the, in the Q&A, um, we're working a lot on some health and safety issues and environmental justice issues that are um, being debated in the Congress right now. And I did not include, I'll put those in the Q&A as well. Um, we are also supportive of OSHA developing heat stress standards for workers. Um, there was a comment that's a long process, it's too long to talk about, but we did submit comments to OSHA and we hope that they will develop um, heat stress standards. But also, we're also supporting the Climate Stewardship Act. And I think that's important because there are lots of climate, there's lots of climate bills out there and most of them tout false solutions. And so we are not supportive of those. The Climate Stewardship Act is um, the best of the few, uh, of the many um, climate um, acts that are, or bills that are being proposed. Um, but we work with others in coalition and we are supporting uh, the Climate Stewardship Act. So I hope that helps to answer some of those questions and I'm happy to talk more about it if there's more questions, thanks. Thank you, that's a very helpful, very forward so. Um, so we got a question um, directed for Michael, but I think anyone who wants to jump in and answer as well could feel free to. Um, talking about the loss of you know, different seed varieties and such. Um, and Tess was wondering if the big agricultural corporations are pushing back against moves that are trying to tear down their hegemony and what concerns you might have about steps that big ag might be taking to counter this. And Michael, if you would like to start, please do. Well, sure, of course we should be concerned always, especially when such a few number of companies own so much. And, and frankly, any discussion we have about reform has to go to campaign finance reform because we can never actually get the right reforms we want as long as special interest uh, has such way with the direction of our policy. So uh, yes, it's a concern, but that should not deter us from continuing to do the right thing. Um, that, that's my two cents. I'm more than happy to hear other thoughts about this. I'd like to jump in if that's okay. I saw that there was a question in the Q and A um, about you know, what can be done um, to, um, get significant change. 
um, what what bills to support, um, like in the farm bill um, and other kinds of bills to support. And while I think it's really important to understand um, where to put efforts and what bills to support, the reality is, as long as we have the current system and the current leaders making these decisions, it's really important to understand what control the agrochemical companies have and big ag, not small farmers, but big ag have on our political system. And that's nationally and internationally. And as long as there is corporate control of our political systems all over the country and all over the world, then we're gonna to continue to have the big corporations dominating our system of agriculture. So we really need a um, consciousness shift and we don't get a consciousness shift through the current political system. So we need political reform. I know this is kind of, it seems like, like where is this coming from? Because we're talking about agriculture um, and resilience, but as long as we have in place the current system, then all the other things are just gonna be little, uh, little wins here and there that you have to fight again in five or 10 or 20 years. So we need real systemic change. And some of that includes getting uh, corporations out of, our, um, out of our political system, getting more control at the local level. Um, and so I think we need you know, to look at our, our um, political structure and um, really address that. Um, so bills that mean for political work for political reform. Thanks. I'd like to just add on to that as well. Um, I feel that, um, so I, I, I went to uh, do a master's degree in theology because I felt like change, um, uh, you know, needed to happen um, at that kind of spiritual level. And then I decided, oh, no, people listen to folks that uh, present hard science facts. So then I went to do a PhD in ecology. And then uh, the end of that, I realized, no, um, people need spiritual heart conversions if they're going to, uh, to make these kinds of decisions that generate more equitable life ways. And um, so what Jeannie's talking about really resonates with me about the consciousness shift. Um, I, I think about the, the arrogance of big ag, corporate control to take the, the the thousand of years of spiritual investment in these in the corn as one example, and then to say uh, we have the right to genetically modify this sacred being in our culture. It's uh, the corn is an old woman, and how can you treat her in this way to take her into a laboratory and manipulate her in that way? Without this kind of cosmological worldview that grounds us in the sacredness of the other living beings in which we with with whom we interact every day uh we we won't see uh, uh the kinds of changes that we're begging for um so i i i uh, concur that we really uh, have to ap approach this in in ways that will will bring a spiritual transformation um hello everyone um i'm garrett grady lovelace I am calling in from um, Kentucky, Shawnee, Biscato Shawnee lands, and originally from DC, working on Biscataway lands and um, hosting as part of American University Center for Environment, Community Equity. And I just wanted to echo what Marcus um, just said so powerfully and say that there's an international conversation about this. This is happening all over the world. People are asking these same questions. So international solidarity is gonna be so key as we think through that massive transformation toward the direction that Marcus is leading. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, we had another question that was directed towards Marcus, but I think really kind of builds off of the one that we just were talking about. Um, so Andrew says that as you listen to the details of your community's work, he feels like this localized approach is the best way forward to deeply revolutionize your system, but it takes such hard place-based work that you described. And will it take the total breakdown of society to push us in that direction, or are there other ways to, to inspire this? Oh, um, 
I, I'm afraid that um, it, it will take a total uh, societal collapse before people wake up and, and, and folks will get uh, swallowed up. Uh, there's so many unpredictable factors. I mean, I mean even just looking at the, the, the cascade effect with metals, for instance, I mean, that kind of trajectory puts us all back in, in you know, cave people's times, if you will, um, in the long run. So, you know, every, everybody is um, going to be extinguished at some level, but, you know, we could get, you know, blown up by, by uh, some uh, nation state, if you will, uh, before then, or, or climate crisis could uh, take folks. <laughs> uh, we don't do it um, out of fear, or um, we do it we do what we do as a land-based uh, project because it's the right thing to do. Um, and we hope that more people will, will um, cultivate compassion and love in their hearts and do things because it's the right thing to do. And, you know, we know that um, this isn't universal uh, for, it's not for everybody. Uh, we believe it's for everybody, but not everyone uh, will come to subscribe to it. Um, but, we pray and we act um, and and uh, carry on in that way. Otherwise, you know, uh, as indigenous peoples, we we feel the uphill battle every day. Um, I think um, I, I think folks th that are are wanting to do good, um, you know, regenerative farmers, organic farmers in general, want to do good. It uh, it's it's really tough to to. Um, to live in this way. And as Kevin mentioned, you know, all the greenwashing that's happening, everybody wants the cheap food. Um, you know, why do we have to have meat in every meal? Um, you know, and, and if we do, we want it cheap. And, and uh, you don't know um, the energy that you're putting into your body from that uh, meat and the way that it was um, uh, handled in, in uh, the factory or on the farm. And, and so I, I would want to pay um, to not have meat every day, but I would want to pay extra money to know that it came, that the meat is accompanied by much love and compassion by the people um, that, that uh, interacted with it, live with those, those living beings. And um, those are the folks that I want to also uh, have good relationship with and not be constantly torn down by the all the people that are working against us, we always have to confront them, but building um, relationships with other people that feel similarly to us is what keeps us going. Again, I'm gonna jump in just for one quick minute. Um, it's really, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been involved in um, social justice for about 40 years. And it's really important for people to understand if you're gonna do this work, you have to be in it for the long term. I, I did this work for about five years. I got burned out. It was so intense, it was so heavy, and I had to leave for a while. And I came back because I am committed to the community. This the, the farm worker community is now my community. And I was fighting for climate change 30 years ago. We had a climate justice alliance in Florida in 2000 and, uh, 2000 and 2001. And here it is over 20 years later and we still don't have a climate justice plan in Florida. We were fighting against chlorpyrifos, a really horrible pesticide for 20 years. We finally won an EPA victory and now the agrochemical corporations are trying to go back and reverse the victory we got, we got against chlorpyrifos. We fought for 20 years to get the worker protection standard, which is the standard under the EPA. It's the regulations to protect farm workers from pesticide exposure. It took us 20 years to get the worker protection standard improved. And of course, we got pushed back from industry. Although knock on wood, we, want, we still have most of what we got in the new worker protection standard. But this is hard work and you gotta stick at it and you gotta believe in it. And you have to understand that the communities deserve this commitment, this work, because these are the people that often don't have, I'm talking about farm workers again, that often don't have voices because they are so um, discriminated against and so disparaged by our systems. So it's hard work, policy change is important, but even when you win a victory, even after you've won a fight, 
you have to be vigilant because there's going to be efforts to try and take it down again. So it's constant work. And I agree with Marcus. It's going to take, uh, 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 why are we talking about climate change in 2022 when we knew about it 50 years ago? It's going to take deep work by all of us. It is going to take national and international collaborations. And I will say there's an African saying that um, the, the tiger might be strong, but a spy the spiders can catch them in a, in a spider's web. So it's going to take all of us building spider webs at the local level and building alliances uh, across the nation and, and, and internationally to help tie up the tiger because it's a formidable uh, issue. Um, but that's the only way we're going to get change and, and bring power back to our communities and to ourselves and to the people who deserve it most. Thanks. Great. Right. Well, I'm going to move to another question. We have so many great questions coming in. Please keep them coming. Um, so this one is from Max, and it's for the general um, general panelists, anyone who wants to jump in. Um, and he's wondering what you all think of the latest trend of incorporating big data and also called agritech into agriculture. Um, and he kind of sees it as a way for tech companies to team up with Monsanto to further entrench control and farmer dependency. But maybe we can speak a little bit more if my city wants you on that idea. I'll just jump in and say there's also, this is a huge issue. Um, there's also an issue in digital sequence information and the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources um, that was just introduced by Michael um, has a whole move in it, even though it began as a goal for farmers' rights and to support and protect farmers' rights to save a seed apart from intellectual property regimes. Now there's a whole move to have digital sequence information and kind of large-scale genomic sequencing and have that data um, not, not have anything to do with benefit sharing or equitable access to gene, genetic resources in the gene bank. So there's a broader tension around data within just you know, ag, ag data and the surveillance of farmers around the world and who owns that data, but also the germplasm and gene banks. So it's a huge issue. There's massive capital coming in and the UN FAO and the broader international forum that largely were spaces of defending farmers from kind of corporate capture are largely being captured themselves. We just saw the UN Food System Summit last year and the risks that that, um, that leads to. So it's a crucial question. Yeah, and on top of that, sometimes these smart farming systems really kind of tie into specific seeds from specific companies, which again, is just ways for them to kind of grab grab more power. Um, Michael, did you want to answer anything on that? Or Kevin, we haven't heard from you, both of you in a little while. I don't have much to add to what has already been said. I think it's exactly right. It is a leapfrogging of power grabbing and we have to keep staying ahead of the next thing because data is also power. So yes, these are real and yes, we must pay attention. Okay, so I'm gonna shift gears here to the next question. We had a couple questions that were pretty similar in content. Um, basically asking about how to be balanced, you know, the need for good quality food and also the fact that, you know, doing so and doing practices that are um, regenerative might actually lead to increased cost of food. Um, so how to be balanced that, especially for um, communities that have, have less means of purchasing food. Um, I'll just make a, a quick uh, comment uh, introductory to the subject and hope um, others will jump in, but um, we have struggled with this. Um, we, we decided in our community that, um, you know, because we have to factor in the cost to uh, raise all these animals to have quality food and crops here in the community. So it costs us to eat here uh, well. 
And um, we think it's worth it for us because it's, it's part of our commitment to decolonize our diets. Um, and, you know, I, we feel that um, the cheap food uh, is an attack, uh, particularly on our genotypes as minority people, most of us uh, indigenous folks, people from Africa, um, all people really, but uh, we're, we're the folks that are suffering the highest rates of um, chronic illnesses. And uh, the more that we subscribe to this idea, I mean, like eating meat in, 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 the, in your every meal um, is kind of associated with not feeling like you're living in poverty every day. Um, because for so long, meat was only accessible to people that, that uh, had uh, the financial means to acquire it. And um, but for us, um, we also forage. I think it's really important uh, to remind people um, that there is a whole food source. Uh, you don't have to just go buy organic vegetables in, um, just, uh, in, in the supermarket. And just because something is organic doesn't mean it's nutrient dense, but all those volunteer plants um, that are, are growing all around us in forests um, that are accessible to people in some cases, uh, you know, depending on how racist your area is. But um, uh, these are, these are um, things that we need to teach people again, is how to recognize food in the natural world. There's so much of it out there that will be nourishing us. And um, the same uh, for, for meat. I mean, you can't, not everybody can go and hunt in the woods. It's not in, 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 there are too many people on the planet for that, but um, raising animal in um, a regenerative way, it's not just the meat that you're consuming, but when you sit down to it, maybe you have the meat you know, once a week or something. If you put all that money together that you used on the commodity, or even, you know, when we lived on food stamps, my family, we, we used our um, EBT card to purchase uh, healthy food. And um, we, we were very sparing with, you know, instead of buying cheap meat to have three times a week, we would buy um, regeneratively, re regeneratively raised meat. Um, and that was important to us because we're not just putting uh, the nutrients into our body from the meat, but uh, the 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 uh, spiritual connection as as well as we hope that the person that uh, raised that animal um, had a a was in a good way uh, with with that animal uh, prior to it being harvested. I could chime in a little bit if you wish. I think all of what Marcus has said is quite powerful, but we also need full cost accounting because if we actually priced the cost of pollution and the cost of cancer and the cost of cleaning up the environment onto the industrial food supply, it would become very, very expensive to buy industrial food. So this whole movement toward full cost accounting is quite critical because in the end, regenerative, organic, sustainable food is actually cheaper than industrial food if we bring all the externalities back into the equation, which has been conveniently distracted and taken out of the price, which gives us the so-called cheap food, which is not very cheap. Thank you. Um, I have a question here from Elizabeth Henderson. She's a longtime contributor and partner in this project. Um, and she was wondering, what would you say to the young would-be farmers out there um, about the significance of the farming work that they do? And this includes you know, the connection between college-educated white would-be farmers, um, immigrant farmers, um, and indigenous farmers. What kind of future lies ahead for all of them as they work together to produce food?
can ask this a different way too. So those of you who have been doing this fight for for a long time, I mean, what would you say to somebody young who comes up to you and says that they want they want to farm nowadays? Well, this is Jeannie. I'll jump in. Um, the USDA has a program um, for um, um, black and brown um, small farm farmers. And um, it's not the best, but it does exist. And um, we, there are some resources there for people that want to go and to the USDA and access funding through that program. Um, so that is one option. Um, but then also I think it's really important to um, learn from others and find some of the resources out there. I think the best way to really learn is um, to work with others in the community and um, find local resources and communities that are, are doing that. Um, however, there is the problem of you know, finances, getting, getting loans and getting capital and getting access to land. And um, right now, one of the things where places to go is unfortunately the federal government um, with all its policies of discrimination, et cetera. Um, but then also um, one of the things that we believe that philanthropy should start doing is not just giving money for programs, but they should be giving money for um, access to land. So black and brown potential farmers can have access to land. That's one of the things we have uh, four community gardens. We've had a terrible time getting access to land. In fact, we just lost one of our community gardens in South Florida because it, we were uh, using the land that by the um, the county was letting us use the land, and then they sold the land. And this beautiful big community garden, acres of a community garden that we had, where we had planted fruit trees and raised beds, we had we had a very verdant and sustain beautiful uh, garden, and we lost it all because it was uh, county land. So I think philanthropy needs to start stepping up to the plate and start giving money for people to buy land, for, for people, for small farmers, um, and black and brown and indigenous farmers to be able to buy land and to be able to do their own farming. And I wanna say one more thing, because we haven't really brought up the issue of immigration. Um, I think it's really important. We've been talking about food and regenerative agriculture and climate change and, um, and the food system, but we haven't really talked about immigration. And it's really important to talk about that because that really, uh, today, so many farm workers in this country are people who have been displaced from their subsistence um, communities in their home countries, in Mexico, in Honduras, where they did have communities, where they did do local farming in community, as Marcus was saying, working not as individuals, but working as communities. And because of um, US policies like NAFTA and CAFTA, whatever NAFTA is called now, um, and, um, and, and um, corporate control. Uh, there's a really good book called um, Eating NAFTA. It's excellent. I highly recommend, I'll put it in the, in the Q&A. Um, but um, it, it's really important to understand um, how corporations have gone into other countries and destroyed these subsistence communities. And now we have this influx of immigrants whose communities have been destroyed, whose agricultural systems in their communities have been destroyed. And so they have to find some place to live and, and, and eat and survive. And so I think it's important to really factor that into all of this discussion. Thanks. I'd like to just um, chime in on that discussion as well. I, I think it's so critical and something people don't like to talk about is access to land. Um, when we first started um, pursuing the return to our homelands, uh, there, we just kept being met with closed doors um, saying, you know, we want to support your programming, but we, we can't give you money for land. And we said, well, that's great, but how are we supposed to do the things we're proposing if we don't have access to land? And of course, it sucks that we had to buy our own land back. But um, uh, since Jeannie mentioned immigration, too, I just want to bring up, you know, just recalling to mind that, you know, all white folks are immigrants here, but um, we... We, we feel, I, you know, 
some to some indigenous peoples the decolonial paradigm is like white folks are gonna disappear and 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 um and then we're gonna like you know reclaim all the land and i don't see any white people buying boat tickets back to europe not to mention it would exacerbate the climate crisis because you can't fit that many people into scotland or england or whatever so um you know we we want good neighbors and we have to recognize that our liberation is all tied and so um you know we yeah we have to support um black and brown people we got to support white people too because if white people um are 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 willing to adopt a more collectivistic communal living style and be in right relationship with the natural world and and develop intergenerational ties to a particular ecological bioregion it's very important that we support that as well uh, there was a question about um, land back to indigenous peoples and I like to remind folks that just because somebody says they're indigenous doesn't mean that they have the land and in, 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 in the best interest of the land at heart. Um, you know, our people have widely converted to capitalist ideologies and um, participate in extraction, but many of our people are seeking to to uh, decolonize our 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 uh, way of life and and uh, we this needs to be supported but um all peoples uh black brown and and even white people that you know in some ways have had more access uh, to resources than others but when it comes to this um kind of small scale farming uh situation a lot of white people that are doing good things also lose land and their their uh access to be in right or their ability to be in right relationship with the natural world and so i um, I certainly hope that that uh, more black and brown people have access to um, land for for uh, a tenure for for regenerative life ways, including agriculture and all the other facets that a holistic paradigmatic shift uh, necessitate, but um, want to see uh, anybody that wants to live in right relationship with Mother Earth be supported by the philanthropic world. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, I we are almost almost out of time, but as a closing question for everyone, this one comes from Patty Naylor, who is another longtime contributor and partner in the Disparity to Parity Project. Um, and she'd like to hear from the presenters um, briefly how displacing disparity with parity relates to the issues that you presented. I was just going to invite all the speakers to turn your video on for our final few minutes. Um, such and such excellent questions. I was just rereading them. That all needs to be saved. Such a wonderful set of really critical questions. Well, I'm happy to jump in. I'm sorry to be talking so much, but um, just in terms of farm workers, um, you know, again, it's there's no quick fixes. One of the things that we're doing in Florida. Um, is to try and build leadership among farm workers so that they're able to um, speak for themselves. And it's really incredible when you see people who have been um, marginalized for so long. And in Spanish, it's called humilde. There isn't a really good translation for that into English, but it's people that are very reticent or um, um, afraid to speak out. It's really incredible to see people develop their leadership and be able to speak out for themselves and go to Tallahassee or Washington, D.C. and give testimony. Um, so it, that's a start. Um, and it's giving people the power in their own hands. Um, we're talking about it's, it's a big lift. And so it has to come on various different fronts to try and get parity. We do need to work on local, state and national and international policies. And we also have to work on um, um, a policy work, but grassroots organizing and working with individuals to help them develop their um, leadership and skills to advocate for themselves and their communities on their own behalf. Michael or Kevin or Marcus, either of you want to talk about how um, your themes relate to replacing disparity with parity. I can say a few things. Uh, I guess having farmed through the old parity system, when I envision a new one, 
we have to think far more broadly as to how this will work both ecologically, socially, culturally, environmentally, even spiritually, if we are indeed to pass on something that can work for everyone. So when I talk about seeds and the need to have that to be a part of the mix, that would be a part of a, of a new, you know, a, a Green New Deal, that we would, we would take that on, that farmers' rights and workers' rights would be embedded into that parity system. The old system was exclusive and did not work for all farmers. And at the same time, it kept many farmers in business uh, when others went out of business because it created a floor under the market. So it had value and it had importance, but we have to re-envision what it looks like because it has to be a different model that is far more inclusive and more, and more uh, envisionary, in, in my opinion. And I agree with everything that's said, and it's, it comes back to education. Um, look at the tiny percentage of people that are actually going to try to make a difference. Um, that's, that's the issue with trying to get uh, fair prices for everybody and, and teaching people that maybe it appears that organic food is more expensive than conventional, but as Michael so eloquently said, and I tried to say, it's that's not the case. Um, there are too many hidden costs to conventional food with regard to the environment, with regard to people's health, um, with regard to energy usage that simply aren't being attributed to their um, to the price of that food. And the toughest part is when you have people in power that take food for granted. Um, they make bad decisions. So it's, it's all going to come back down to trying to educate people, everybody that, uh, you know, the, what, like we said, the, the mainstream is not working and it's not a long-term viable uh, agricultural system. And small family farms are, are what build our country. And that's what's going to keep keep not only our country, but the world going. And I agree with everything that's been said too. Um, and, and just really appreciate all the voices um, that are here. Uh, I, I feel like um, education, um, sometimes we, we bear that burden and always, the people that want to do right are always trying to educate ourselves uh, about a better way to do something um, that honors uh, Mother Earth, that honors all peoples on the planet, all life, um, and and that will will birth uh, this feeling of equity one day, um, the feeling of parity one day. I I think um, that. that the intellectual component is so necessary um, to be thinking through. We can't do this. One person can't do it. Just, uh, you know, a few leaders can't do it. We have to put all our minds together. We, we pray that um, we'll be of one mind and, and we have to put our minds together to solve these problems. Um, but the prayer uh, is so important to get us through because we feel discouraged so often um, when we start mapping out the problems. And, and so uh, the prayer is what's going to create uh, the pathways that that uh, open up the the liberation and as Jeannie said you know we we can't stop this is a lifetime commitment you can't just get discouraged and quit the game because uh, this isn't a game this is uh this is life and people's lives and uh, biodiversity um, as you saw in Michael's presentation that, that when we talk about biodiversity we we tend to lock it into encapsulate in statistics and we forget that those are living beings 
uh, those are those. Uh, th there's a connection between humans and uh, the varieties that have been um, birthed into the world here. Uh, there's a spiritual connection that we are throwing away, uh, and and uh, this is an injustice. And so uh, we should be mourning that and uh, acting, uh, using that as the drive uh, to to seek change and remembering though that. You know, we we have this creator, this Mother Earth, that uh, are supporting us too, and that we can't we can't give up in in our quest here. And uh, so I, I, you know, the, the saying uh, in our among our people is "Momesh komet abiyagatis." This is the saying that was being uh, shared between people as we were being uh, marched out of our homelands. Uh, so many people dying around, and they said, uh, you know, to have faith and keep going. Um, that we'll get there, we'll get there. We'll get there. And um, so I, uh, we can't stop working to get there. It doesn't just happen, but I want to say um, we lift each other up, eating gaya bit fully and we're going to get there. Madho, Beautiful, beautiful. Words. Thank you, Sister Mary. So just want to give my heartfelt thank you to each of our panelists for just taking the time to share so much with us today. Um, you can hear more from them and many other of you are farmers and activists and scholars who have contributed to this Disparity to Parity project on the website. I um, also want to thank the American University students who helped uh, facilitate the tech end of this webinar. Um, you can look forward to a video recording of it and please stay tuned for future ones. Thank you everyone and be well. <laughs>